Okay, back to class. No recitation this week, and we're going to do molding and casting. Uh, if laser cutters are overused even in fab labs, I'd say molding and casting is one of the most underused capabilities. It's less familiar uh, for in general for hobbyists and one of the most powerful expressive things you can do. So uh, this is a creative fun week. So you're going to make molds and cast. So I'm going to show a few examples to start. Uh, this was Adrian's assignment. And in his day job, he works with real trains. And so he made a train mold. And then um, these are different colors of plastic trains. Uh, this is a, um, a candle wax crane train. This is a sort of stone concrete train. Uh, these are chocolate trains. Yeah, no electronics at all this week. Uh, this was a project to make a balance bike, and the molding and casting assignment was to make the tires. So here's tires for the bike. And uh, last one was a student named uh, Hank in Amsterdam. And the student named Hank made uh, tempe molds. And so this huge range of materials and really interesting surface finishes all done in molding and casting. Uh, and then you're going to do, actually, yeah, let me, I'll explain that now. Um, this was an early example that's uh, still one of the best examples. Uh, this was a foosball table. And so uh, these are molds that are rigid molds that then are used to cast these elastomer molds. And then the elastomer molds um, uh, are used to cast the characters. Uh, uh, Michelle, I'm looking at the, the thread in the chat. That's lovely. Um, I assume the grandson approved. Uh, and so if you look at the, the foosball characters, uh, they have a beautiful surface finish. And in this case, they're insert molded. So they're actually cast in place around um, the shaft for the foosball table. Uh, and so that's all an example of molding and casting. So there's many kinds. Uh, so many of the um, uh, products around you, like say, uh, this are made by injection molding. Um, and uh, this is an example of a um, small scale laboratory injection molding machine. And so in injection molding, you heat plastic pellets and force them into a mold. And just some of the terms are the sprue is where it enters the mold. The runner is how it gets from the um, into the mold cavity. Um, uh, in the mold cavity, um, it, it enters the, the molten material through the gate. Um, there's a cavity, there's a vent you need for the air to exit. A parting line is the boundary between the mold faces. And done carefully, you can't see it. Done poorly, there's an obvious parting line. And then flashing is material that gets trapped between parts of the mold. And done properly, there's no flashing. Done poorly, there's a lot of flashing you have to trim. So injection molding is widely used to make much of what you see around you. Uh, insert or over molding is where you put something in the mold. And so this was an example where instead of making a package for your electronics, uh, a mold was actually 
uh, designed to mold around the electronics. So you put the electronics in the mold and then you completely cast around it. And um, it, it's conformal, it fits perfectly, it's uh, water tight. Uh, it's an interesting way to package. Um, vacuum forming is the killer app for this is product packaging. So you take a sheet, um, you heat it, you soften it and you pull a vacuum and it sucks around it. So it's limited to sheets you deform. So you can't do the wide range of materials um, I showed you. And it's limited for how fine the features can be. But it's a really quick, easy way to deform one thing around another thing. So making like masks, um, uh, helmets, and again, product packaging is most common for that. Uh, blow molding is how bottles are made. You inflate a polymer into a mold. Uh, roto molding, uh, this was a Fab Academy final project where um, you tum tumble the mold. And so um, in roto casting, you, you put the material in the mold and then you tumble it in all the axes. And what that does is rather than a solid, it, for, it, it, it drives the material to the surface of the mold. And then it lets you um, cast something that rather than being uh, dense is pushed out to, to wet the surfaces of the mold. Oops. Um, so that's uh, uh, roto molding. Um, Vacuum and pressure assisted is um, you can use pressure to force material in the mold. You can use vacuum to pull air, air out of the mold. Um, die casting uh -huh. is uh, with um, uh, molten metal. Investment casting is where you melt away uh, wax form. And then what we're going to do this week is called flexible or soft tooling molding. And so here's a good example of what we're going to be doing. So uh, this is a machine tool controller made as a molding and casting assignment. So uh, here's the molds. Um, then in the molds, um, so that, that one was used to ca cast the outside. Um, then here's a mold he's using to cast the flexible part. And he does a neat thing, which is he fills the bottom of the mold with one color and the rest with another color. And so it makes this multicolor multi keypad. And then here are the switches. And then when he puts it all together, um, here's the controller he did as a molding and casting assignment. Uh, with this, one of the big differences compared to what you've done before is now production. So uh, Janice liked cats and so she made a cat mold and then um, I'll talk about food safety um, these are cast cats these are chocolate cats and then this is a production line making uh, lots of cats so uh, soft tooling is often used as a test before um, rigid tooling and it's much more forgiving in the mold design. And I'll talk about that when we get to, to mold design. Um, so I have this link. This is a project where um, we made parts to make this uh, morphing airplane. And each of those voxels was made with a really complex mold. It's a 12 part mold. To make each part, 12 different faces come in to cast the complex 3D geometry. So that's a very complex one. Um, this is one done as a class project. Um, he wanted to make a tesseract, a 3D projection of a 4D cube. Um, to do that, if we go to the end, um, here's what he made. And if you were to look at that, you might think you couldn't cast that in a mold. You would have to 3D print it. But the clever thing he did is he came up with this geometry of each of these faces comes together and you assemble all of them. And when you demold, you get this structure. So as long as you can decompose into a set of projections, you can mold 
really complex nested structures uh, as a mold uh, rather than a print. Uh, now, the, the alignment of the parts is critical. And so this is an example where he's going to cast LEDs. Here's his mold. And to help with the alignment, he's making a frame that registers the parts. And then when it comes out, he gets these glowing cast uh, LEDs. And uh, this example shows an important, a couple important tricks. So here's a mold for one face. Here's a mold for the other. When you assemble them, uh, you, you make the self-inverting top. In this, the fill goes in through the shaft. When it comes out of the mold, here's the vent, and there's a little tab you need to snap off. And then I'm doing two tricks here. Um, one trick is the parting line is at the edge of the lip of the top, so you don't notice it on the mold because the parting line is aligned with the feature. And then the second thing I'm doing there is something you'll commonly see in mold making that I don't like is if you look at this mold, you'll see bumps there and depressions here. And the idea is the bumps go in the depression to align the two parts, but it doesn't align it very well. In this top, what I'm doing is I've got um, one whole side of the mold um, with a lip. And then that's fitting in all the way around the other side of the mold. And so if we go back to here, you'll see this whole edge fits in this edge. So I'm using the complete perimeter of one mold to register the other mold. And that gives me a much tighter constraint on how the two parts of the mold fit together. So it's not just an alignment pin, which you can use for a steel mold in injection molding, but for a flexible mold, I'm using the whole perimeter to more tightly constrain it. Um, and so once you do all of that, um, th this is making a self-inverting top that turns upside down when you spin it. So we're going to do flexible tooling uh, to do short run production of with soft molds this week. So vendors, uh, the number one vendor for this week is SmoothOn. SmoothOn makes all sorts of materials you see when you go to a movie that are used in movie special effects. And they make every possible material for molding and casting. And I'm going to cover all sorts of materials uh, from them. Uh, uh, Dick Blick makes molding materials for art. Uh, West Marine makes materials for boat building that often uh, uses molding. Uh, USG makes um, sort of plaster-based materials I'll talk about. Um, uh, Aremco makes high temperature molding material to make ceramics. Um, Proto Labs is a flexible uh, job shop. And once you make a mold, uh, if you then want to go to higher production, you can go to them and turn it into uh, an injection molding run. So what is the materials we're going to use? This is a handy material to be aware of. This is a low temp wax that melts just above room temperature. So you can push something into it, take it out and get an impression. And you can also soften this and use this uh, if you make, if you have problems in a mold, if like part of it breaks or you, you mill off the end, you can use this to do surgery on molds, um, but it's not very high resolution. Uh, this is machinable wax. And I'm going to cover two different ways to make your molds. One way is subtractively by machining. One is additively by printing. Um, the machinable wax, you can machine to very high resolution to get these beautiful surface finishes, mold from it. And then you can also remelt it when you're done and use it uh, many times. Uh, rigid foam 
used to build building insulation, uh, you can use as a molding material. It's much lower resolution, but this is good if you want really big molds, for example, for architectural trim. Um, if you use that, you need to finish the surface so that the molding material doesn't go in the foam. Um, you can paint it with gesso, you can paint it with epoxy, you can um, shrink wrap it, you can melt the surface with hot air or always with um, rigid foam. Um, Alginet is an interesting material. This is an uh, algae-based biomaterial. Um, it makes sort of moist, gooey molds, but the main thing is it's biosafe. So if you want, for example, a mold of a face or of your hand, you can um, put it into alginet and it's biosafe. And then you can't use it over and over it's, the, it's a gel, but what you can do is you can make one cast from this, and then you can use that in other materials to copy it. Uh, so the killer app for that is casting uh, bioparts. Then urethane is one of the main molding materials. So um, you can get urethane rubbers like um, the PMC. Uh, this does deep section cures. It cures in the volume, doesn't matter the thickness. Very high resolution surface finish, um, very strong and good dimensional tolerance. So when you make a mold, you can bend it to take a part out. You can cast another part and it comes right back to the same shape. So you can use this to make tough rubber parts if you want a flexible part and a really robust molds. Um, you can also get urethane plastics that are rigid. Um, urethane plastic isn't happy to cast in urethane rubber. You, you need to use a dissimilar material, but in it, you can cast the urethane plastic and other molding material. And then what, you're sh what it's showing here is there's all sorts of colorants you can add. So you can add just plain color, um, but you can also add all sorts of other materials. So all of these parts that look like silver or brass or wood are just a urethane plastic doped with additives that let you vary uh, what they look like. Um, for clear molding, um, this is a... Um, clear, uh, flexible uh, material. And uh, SmoothOn has nice videos, and I'm gonna go through it, these a few different times. So typically these are two-part systems. Um, sometimes it's by weight, sometimes by volume. We typically use volume. Um, then you pour out the amounts of the two components. And this is by volume, so you just pour out the same amount. We mix them, and I'm gonna talk a lot about the mixing so you don't uh, get air trapped. Um, notice in the mixing, the shearing, it's moving horizontally, not vertically. I'll talk about that, that's so you don't trap air. Um, you mix it, you then pour it in the mold, and you're pouring carefully to not trap air, and then um, it sets, and in this case, um, we made a vase with clear water, but the water doesn't come out. So this is a flexible molding material. Um, uh, this is then a, and then here's another one of these. Yikes. Um, this one, it, you need to weigh because they're different um, uh, uh, volumes. And then we go through all the same steps of mixing, stirring, pouring, um, it goes into the mold, um, and then it comes out. And if you do it properly, it's perfectly clear. And then if you do it improperly, there are bubbles, which I'll talk about. But this is a nice uh, clear casting material. And then in turn, you can use that to encapsulate all sorts of uh, other things. Then one of the main materials for this work is umu. Um, urethane needs ventilation. It's sort of comparable to painting. Uh, 
you, you can't do it in an enclosed space without air exchange. Uh, the silicone is much friendlier. You can use that in any environment. It sticks to almost nothing. It's very inert. Um, it doesn't need special ventilation. Um, it's not quite as tough as the urethane. So you can make molds. It makes soft material. The molds won't last quite as long as the urethane molds. Um, but it's a flexible, very easy to use material. And so that's uh, one of the main materials that we'll be using. And again, it's got very fine detail for surface finish and it's got good dimensional tolerance. It, it maintains its uh, shape very nicely. So that's um, silicone and that, that's one of the main material we're gonna use. Um, there's also high temperature silicone um, you can use for metal casting. And I'll talk more about that to do um, custom coins. And PDMS is used for um, nano imprint lithography where you make molds that actually make nanostructures. Uh, latex, I would stay away from. This is a material you paint on, but it has to dry on the surface. If you make it too thick, it doesn't dry and just stays gooey. So you can spend a week painting it on. The one good use for latex is if you have, for example, a carving on a building and you need to take an impression from it, it's a convenient that you paint the latex because you can paint it onto a structure, let it dry and peel it off. But it's, it's a laborious process. Otherwise, I would stay away from uh, latex rubber. Um, then for molding and casting, uh, there are thermoplastics versus thermosets. Um, the distinction between thermoplastics and thermosets are um, uh, whether you can uh, remelt it when you're done, like the machinable wax, or when you mix it, it sets and it never changes, uh, like the epoxy for polymers. Um, then we get to the calcium-based compounds. So calcium sulfate is a really interesting material. Um, when it gets wet, it doesn't absorb the water. It actually takes the water up into the chemical structure. And so this is used to keep food dry. It's actually used as an ingredient in uh, food. It, it's used in plaster and uh, gypsum and drywall. And so dry stone is, um, let's see, uh, I'll talk about uh, printing versus machining molds in a bit uh, on how, how you make the molds. Um, dry stone is uh, extremely cheap. This is about a dollar a pound. It's a casting material. And if we go back to, um, this example, um, the, the, these white cats are done in dry stone. If you look at it, it actually looks like plastic, but it's actually made out of stone. Um, it, it's an environmentally friendly material, um, very low cost, uh, very easy to use. And so one of the main combinations we want to do this week is Umu silicone molds and then dry stone. Now, related to that, this is hydrostone. Um, again, very low cost, very easy to use. And what that does is it starts with the calcium sulfate and it adds some other materials. So um, Portland um, cement um, it is an example that combines the calcium sulfate with these kind of additives. And so if we go back to the cats, the, the gray cats are made with the um, hydrostone. Um, the dry stone is slightly better looking. The hydrostone is slightly stronger. Both of these make what um, end up being uh, smooth surface finish, but otherwise looking and feeling like stone parts. And again, there's questions in the chat about printing. Um, in a bit, I'm going to talk about both subtractive and additive ways to make the molds. Uh, then we get to metal. 
And so one of the fun things you can do this week is make custom coins. So here's a mold. And um, there's an important trick here, which is this is using a particular alloy I'll tell you about. Um, this is using umu, the lower temperature rubber. But if you dust the surface with a uh, baby powder, the baby powder is doing two things. Uh, it's helping protect the surface for temperature. It's also helping the metal wet adhere to the surface. If you don't do that, you get bubbles. But if you do do that, um, you can make uh, beautiful coins, even with a low temperature process. And so in that metal casting, that's using what's called Cerro True. Uh, there are low, so you can cast, high temp alloys like aluminum. But to do that, that's typically done with sand casting, where you cast it into an oil sand. And that's a much more hazardous process. You need to do that in a foundry. Um, so this is, you pack sand around it, and then you, you need good uh, personal protective equipment. Um, uh, you need uh, to melt it in, and do foundry casting. So I wouldn't do that. Uh, in your fab lab, unless you're set up especially for that. But the, then there's low temp alloys that are hazardous metals. Um, Cerro True is um, a bismuth tin, anemone, um, non-hazardous materials, um, but it melts at a low temperature, um, uh, 138C. Um, you can melt it in a toaster oven scale temperature. Um, you can also get these neat little um, pots that are designed to melt and pour all in one go. And so in an office-friendly process, you can cast an umu mold, dust it with talc, melt cerro true, uh, and then cast metal parts. Now, they're not as strong as a high temp alloy, uh, so I wouldn't build an automobile out of them. But for things like uh, jewelry or coins, they look and feel like metal parts and they you know, have you know, fine structural properties for something like that. Uh, this is um, uh, uh, Aremco is a vendor that makes high temperature materials. And so they have molding and casting materials you can mix and um, make ceramic parts. Then food safety is um, really uh, sensitive in that it's a little bit like being kosher, that to be food safe, all the steps of the process have to be food safe, the production of the material, the molds, the casting. And from smooth on, uh, they have a subset of materials that are specifically food safe. Unless it says it's food safe, it's not food safe, and it's hazardous to your health. But this is a really nice one. It makes a translucent rubber. Uh, in some cases, this itself is useful because if you light it, it glows. If you want a rubber that you can't see through, it's good. But uh, one of the main uses for this is then food. So in this, you can then make you know, custom lollipops, you can make chocolate, um, you can cast all sorts of food in the sort of clear. So that's our favorite uh, food safe material. Um, you'll find lots of hobbyists making Play-Doh as a DIY molding material. And then Materiom has lots of um, uh, natural uh, molding materials of recipes for them uh, beyond what you get from a vendor like Smooth On. Okay, so those are the materials. And start with Umu Hydrostone and Drystone. Those are reasonably priced, easy to use, office friendly, um, not hazardous, uh, give good results. I would start with that uh, for this week. Then there are all sorts of additives. So boat building is full of this. Um, this is uh, Jamestown, and they list lots of different uh, additives. So you can add fibers. Um, so generally, these molding materials are good in compression, 
but they're less good in tension. And so you can add fibers to make them stronger in tension. And I'll talk much more about that um, when we get to composites week. And then many different fillers. You can add hollow glass spheres to make a material lighter. Um, you can add nickel or carbon particles to make it conducting. Um, you can add um, rubber particles for uh, flexibility and their hybrid um, rubber concretes that you can bend, for example, um, as well as all of the dopants and colorants I showed you. So all sorts of materials can go into the molds. So uh, processing, uh, this is a messy process. We stay away from hazardous material but these are gooey and sticky materials that'll get in your clothes, that'll get in your hair, it'll be hard to wash off. So um, it, it, it'll cover, get in your carpet if you are using it on a rug. So you want to do this in a messy workspace. It's nice to have a big table spread out. Um, I like to have rolls of paper you can just unroll to cover it and then um, uh, throw away the paper at the end. Uh, something you need to be aware of is um, this was a picture of, this is a container for molding and casting. And somebody had done some casting and then this is what it looked like when they put it away. And what you see is the container is covered with a layer of the resin. And that's multiply bad. It's just gooey and sticky to stick with, but it also means if a little bit of the other material gets in, you actually set the material in the lid and you can't even open the container. So you need to be really clean in pouring, cleaning up, keeping surfaces clean. Um, you need to test these materials. It's really sad to make a beautiful mold, pour in your material, and if it doesn't set properly, you end up with a gooey mess you can't get out. So these materials have a shelf life uh, and they each have procedures for using them. And there's techniques in how you mix them. So the first thing you should do this week is just make little test casts to make sure that the material is in good condition and it's setting properly. So now we get to mixing. Um, the mixing, uh, this is an example with Umu. And so let's do this one a little more slowly. So this one is by volume. So you, so first thing they're doing is they're mixing in the container to make sure that it hasn't separated internally. Then you pour it out by volume, and that's the moment you also need to clean the lip of your container. Then this is one-to-one, -one, so you have the same amount. To know how much you should use, a good trick is you can pour water into your mold and then pour the water back out, measure how much water there is, and use that to get the mold side. Um, uh, let's see, Michelle is recommending Mold Star instead of Umu. Um, that's interesting. Uh, we haven't had issues with reactions to Umu that I'm aware of. Um, uh, here, let me make a note. Um, I haven't used Moldstar. I'm not familiar with it. Um, if you use it, let me know your experience. It, so it looks like it's a different uh, silicone. OK, interesting. Uh, so here we have it one-to-one. -one. Then when you mix them, at this point, they're not mixed. So you want to keep stirring until there's no striations, until the color is uniform. And key here is the, um, I see another note from Moldstar. I'll, I'll try it. I, I wasn't familiar with it. Um, right now, if you scoop like you naturally will do when you're uh, mixing, you're driving in air, the mixing here is done by shearing. 
So it's shearing horizontally and then scooping around the edges to get material trapped there. And you keep doing it until it's homogeneous, until there's no color. Okay, so at that point then, yeah, okay. Michelle's also noting shelf life. It, it does sound like mold star is better. I'll, I'll get some for testing. So now at this point in the mixing, the color is homogeneous. And this step takes longer than you think. A beginner mistake is to do a poor job mixing. And if it's not properly mixed, it won't set in the mold. And so this step takes you know, quite a few minutes. It's longer than you think to get fully mixed. So, um, okay, now pouring in the mold. Now notice, uh, okay, Michelle has both. Yeah, Michelle, I'll be interested in your comparison. The pouring is being done very carefully. If you dump it in, you trap air. So it's, uh, and then you'll see it's being poured in a skinny bead. The skinny bead is preventing, helping to prevent air getting in the mold because if there's bubbles, they'll pop on the way down. And then it's spreading slowly through the mold so it has time to make its way in, uh, slowly spreading. Um, then you let it set. Um, some of these materials set at room temperature, some needs an elevated temperature. The room temperature ones, though, um, you can demold much more quickly if you raise the temperature. This is similar to like bread rising. So you can wait overnight for a silicone at room temperature. If you use a thermal lamp at it, like a desk light that's incandescent, which is increasingly less common, uh, and or put it in a low temp toaster oven, um, you know, within an hour you can demold it. Um, and then um, if it's set properly, it just comes neatly out of the mold. If it wasn't set properly, you have trouble getting it out. And then this is what it should look like, beautiful detail, um, completely uniform. So the, when you do it right, it looks like what's on the right. It's completely featureless. Um, on the left, you get bubbles trapped, and I'll, I'll be talking more about that. So uh, you mold it, um, let it set, um, let it uh, demold. Um, some notes on filling. Um, uh, you want to have a vent at the highest part of the mold to let the air out. And um, uh, well, actually, yeah, let's, let's talk about the bubbles now. So it's very easy to get bubbles trapped in your cast. And so the first way you avoid it is by stirring, instead of scooping by shearing, then you pour in a skinny bead and you let it spread through the mold. Um, once it's in the mold, um, you can gently agitate it. If you, if you shake the mold, air can come up. Um, one of the tricks you can do is it, in your mold, if you have a feature just like this, an air bubble can get trapped there. So you can take a thin layer of the resin and actually by hand paint the surface of the mold. And by painting the surface, you get it into all the nooks and crannies. And then you pour it in um, is a trick if you're having trouble uh, with bubbles, um, you can use a vacuum chamber that pulls air out of the mold. Um, you can use a pressure chamber that, that uh, puts pressure to force the resin into the mold. And then one important trick is just patience, that when you mix your material, wait a little bit to let air come out. Um, and if you pour it too quickly, it's not done. And so wait a little bit longer, mix it, see if air is coming out, mix it a little more and wait till the bubbles stop appearing. Um, and so just a little bit of patience to give the air time to come out is uh, one more step. Um, uh, vacuum versus pressure, uh, both are used, uh, they vary based on the, on the material. It, it, it's based on the vapor pressure of the material, the viscosity, um, some materials, just some materials work better under pressure. Some are better with vacuum. So once it goes in the mold, 
there's a reaction. So the polymers polymerize the uh, hydrostone type materials crosslink, uh, sorry, um, have a hydration reaction. Um, these reactions are typically endothermic, which means they release heat. And that's a useful guide because when you mix it, um, to, ma different materials have different times, but typically the ones we're using, you can demold after about an hour and about a half an hour in, it starts to get warm. And that's a good sign everything is going properly. And then about an hour in, the temperature comes back down. And when the temperature comes back down, that's a sign that it's ready to demold. Um, and then, um, sorry, I said, excuse me, I said it backwards. Um, these are exothermic reactions when it's setting that makes the heat. Um, these can also be endothermic, which means you need to put heat in. So for example, the urethanes typically need an elevated temperature to drive the reaction. And even materials that aren't endothermic benefit from an elevated temperature that lets you drive it more quickly. So you can use a toaster oven for this. I would prominently label not for food. You don't wanna mix a food oven with a molding and casting oven since most materials aren't food safe, but you can accelerate the cure um, and get it out much more quickly and it can cure actually better for almost all of these materials if you slightly elevate the temperature. Uh, so then comes demolding. The main reason we're making flexible molds is if you have, um, um, if your part has an overhang, um, if your mold is rigid, you can't get it out. But if you make a flexible mold, you can bend it to get it out. So that's one of the main reasons we do it. Um, uh, another thing you can do is if you have a completely vertical face and it's in a completely vertical mold, it can be very hard to get it out. And so for that, what you do is you make a draft angle. There's a slope like that. And so by sloping the part, um, then it's much easier to lift out. That's why Lego bricks, if you look carefully, the sides aren't perfectly vertical, but they're slightly sloped. And so the draft angle helps get it out. Then there are all sorts of release agents. And so uh, depending on the combination of materials, you may have some trouble with it sticking. And so you can get mold release, um, dilute, dilute dish soap is used, cooking spray, Vaseline, talc, are all used as mold releases. Then uh, these uh, materials, uh, you need to keep them clean. Um, uh, they typically don't like extreme low or high temp temperatures. And then they have a shelf life. It, it's roughly a year uh, before you open it, depends on the material. And then after you open it, it might be a week you have to use it. When you go beyond the shelf life, it doesn't simply fail. It just doesn't set well. It becomes slightly gooey and doesn't uh, set uh, quite as well. Uh, an exception are the hydrostone and dry stone, you know, th th they'll last beyond your lifetime. They're, 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 they seem to be immune to everything uh, is one more reason we like them. Um, but, but otherwise you don't wanna build a big inventory of these materials. You want to get them as you use them. Uh, they have a shelf life. Now, safety is really important this week. So this is a material. I showed you a, a friendly, clear material. This is an, um, a nice, clear material that's uh, for casting, but it has this description. Uh, when you see materials with the description like this, you should run away from them. Uh, to do this, you need to use it in a chemistry hood wearing good personal protective equipment. Uh, if you don't do it, it can not only make you sick, it can actually mess with your body chemistry. There was somebody in the Barcelona lab who used this. He ended up in the hospital 
and he got sensitized. It actually changed his body chemistry. So he's now sensitive to this material family and has a very strong reaction to it. So um, any chemical comes with a safety data sheet. Um, this is a nice page on reading safety data sheets. Um, all of the materials we're using um, have safety data sheets. The reason there's an art to reading them is if anyone makes anything sound hazardous, the safety data sheet for sugar or salt makes it sound like a hazardous material, but there's levels of hazards they describe. So um, it's very important before you use any molding and casting material, uh, don't trust it. Uh, if it if it doesn't have a safety data sheet, don't go near it. And uh, assuming it does have a safety data sheet, um, you want to read it carefully to understand how to use it. So one of the safety issues is uh, ventilation. Um, again, the silicones generally are uh, office friendly. Um, materials like the urethane, those are like uh, painting. So at MIT, we have to do that in a ventilated room um, or you can do it outside where there's good air exchange. And then beyond that are the materials I showed you uh, that really need to be dealt with like hazardous chemicals. Uh, next is protection. Um, umu, hydrostone, drystone uh, aren't hazardous. But if they get in your clothes, you'll never get them out. Um, and you don't want them in your eyes. You don't want them, obviously, in your mouth. That sounds obvious. But you can um, splash uh, uh, you know, if you do messy things. So when you're doing molding and casting, um, I would wear an apron. Um, I would wear gloves. It's a good idea to wear uh, goggles. You know, uh, um, uh, these materials are not hazardous unless they get inside of you. Um, in fact, Michelle is noting uh, for urethane, uh, you have to do safety tests for professional use. Yeah, in the MIT version, um, people have to go through a uh, safety training. Uh, so again, I would start with materials like umu, hydrostone, drystone that are friendly, and then graduate beyond that if you need it. But you need to be aware of the safety um, from molding and casting. And then the last thing is you don't want to just dump the resins in the environment. The best way to dispose these is to mix them. So if you have a little bit of resin left over and you don't need, um, uh, just mix it together, let it set. In that environment, it's it, in that form, it's much more inert in the environment. If you just throw away the resins, it's it's hazardous chemicals in the environment. Um, <clears throat> so one part of the group assignment is to look at the data sheet, safety data sheets for each of your materials, um, and then uh, do test casts. So I take just a little mixing cup, I mix just a little bit, I pour it in a mixing cup, I let that set, and that checks that my material is in good condition and it's ready. And so as a group, you'll do that. And so now we get to making the mold. And in the past, we only did this by machining. Um, that's slowly becoming obsolete. And so now I'm going to cover um, uh, both options. Let's see. Adrian is showing. Oh, yeah. Just, this is Adrian's uh, just uh, a cast in a test cup. So for this week's assignment, I'm going to show options for both printing a mold and uh, machining a mold. And you can do either one. Uh, but you need to get a good surface finish. So um, this link is to a Formlabs page on um, 3D printing molds um, for injection molding. And then this page is a page Pablo started at an instructor boot camp looking at 3D printing molds. And so below is a machine mold. Up above is a 3D printed mold. 
but this is printed on a um, stereolithography printer. So um, these have come way down in cost. So um, and they've actually come down even more in cost. It's now three hundred dollars. Uh, oh, sorry. The yeah, the um, let's see. I'm not sure what the difference is. Um, so, but yeah, these 12K resin printers, um, their their resolution is at, at you know close to the limit of your tolerance. So this is printed at a resin printer and gives you this beautiful surface finish for the mold. Now, this page has a lot of detail because um, Pablo's had a lot of trouble with the silicone sticking to the uh, 3D printer resin. And he's still experimenting with combinations of materials for the mold release. Um, uh, Adrian or Pablo, is there any update on these experiments? Uh, yeah, Pablo is testing the last uh, comment that you put in the issue with the uh, curing with water uh, inside of the S SLA inside of water and curing. Okay. It's the, it's the next step, but he didn't document it yet. Okay. Um, so one way to do your mold is by printing the mold. Um, the other way is by machining the mold. Now, the reason why, there are a couple of reasons why machining the mold is interesting, even if you have a 3D printer. This is one of the best assignments for this week. So um, what he did was he made this shape. The shape looks trivial, but um, if you turn the shape uh, this way, it spins. Let's see. Um, let me see the right one. Um, if you turn the shape, uh, okay, uh, here we go. The, this top image, if you spin it one way, it doesn't like that and it reverses. If you spin it the other way, it spins. It's like a spinning diode. And what's going on is it's very subtly asymmetrical. So let's go through his page. So here's machinable wax. He's machining the mold. And then look at the surface finish. So you're limited by the machining time. The, the smaller you make the step over, the finer the finish. And, um, but the machines we're using have a positioning resolution uh, so good that if you use a fine step over, you, you can't even see the machining features. So uh, a, a $500 tabletop milling machine um, can machine wax with this tolerance. And then in the machinable wax, he casts the el elastomer and he's just doing a great job this week. You'll see um, there's zero bubbles, perfect surface finish. And then he's casting the dry stone in it. And when it comes out, if you look at this part, it's just completely featureless. It's a perfect surface finish, completely uniform. And all of that's done uh, not by kneading um, resins and 3D printing, but just by machining the machinable wax. So uh, to do that as a subtractive process, and then yeah, the other um, reason why machining is good for molds is in high volume production, uh, injection molding is done with machine molds. You can 3D print molds for short run injection molding, but there's a limit to the lifetime. Once you do high volume um, production, you do it with machined, not printed molds. So to make a mold that looks like what I showed you, um, a rough cut is where you cut horizontally, because remember the end mills like to cut on their sides, not on the bottom. Uh, so this is doing uh, aggressive plunges down and um, fast cutting speed um, to get uh, rough steps horizontally. Um, then th this is doing a finish cut, but I'm using a big step over, and you, so that's not very nice. You can see the clear ridges. Uh, here I'm doing a finish cut with a finer step over, 
and there you barely see the ridges. And then what I did here was I did a finish cut in two directions. And then if you look very finely, you can see uh, the overlap of those. And then this would look even better if I did a finer uh, fi finish cut. One of the other big differences in machining is when you 3D print, you're just limited to the volume size of the printing process. In machining, you separately pick the tool versus the tool path. And the finish is not limited by the tool size, but it's limited by the, the ultimate step size of the machine. And then your patience, how long you're willing to let it run. And so you can get a, a surface finish as good as you want just by you, uh, letting it run for a long time. Now, the other uh, important thing for machining is the uh, tool types. So uh, I typically buy these from Carbide Depot. And um, there are a number of different, let's see, it's loading slowly. There's a number of different <clears throat> types of end mills you can use for this week's assignment. So, yeah, so uh, within each of these families, they list uh, many kinds of end mills. <clears throat> the, um, So a flat end, end mill is exactly that. It's flat on the end. Um, a ball end mill is rounded on the end. Uh, you'll typically hear flat end used for rough cutting and ball end for finish cutting, but that's actually misleading. So uh, 2.5D machining is where you cut in layers. And so with a flat end mill, cutting in layers, you get steps at the edge. Um, with a ball end mill, um, instead of sharp steps, you, you get curves like that um, that are smoother. And so that's one of the reasons to use a ball end mill. Um, however, if you're using a machine tool that can move all the axes simultaneously, you can use a flat end mill, but you can get a continuous smooth surface by moving Z and X or Y at the same time. So one of the main reasons to use a ball end mill is um, uh, if you have a feature to get into, a ball end mill might be able to get in where a flat end mill would hit the sides. But you don't need a ball end mill just to get a smooth surface. You can use a flat end mill um, with continuous motion. Um, because a ball end mill can't give you any flat surfaces. A flat end mill can give you a flat surface as well as a curving one, as long as you move all of the machine axes at the same time. Um, and let's see, uh, Chris is noting Sorotech. <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, Carbide Depot's in the US. I don't know Sorotech. But yeah, that looks similar in spirit to um, Carbide Depot. Now, the other issue is the length of the tool. So one of the challenges for this week is uh, if you make a mold that has a deep, narrow feature, um, you have to get the tool into it. Uh, so if we go back to Carbide Depot, um, they have uh, miniature mills that let you make tiny cuts, but the miniature ones um, have short shanks. And so uh, you can't go very deep and you need lots of horizontal steps. And then you can get these long, narrow ones, which are great. They can go into deep pockets. The problem with these, one is if you overload it at all, you'll break them. But the other is even if you don't overload it, if you machine too fast, they deform. They're less stiff. So you need to slow way down to use the long neck, uh, narrow tools. Uh, and so 
uh, for those reasons, if you're going to machine the mold, you need to work around the tools you're going to be using. Uh, and then the other issue with machining the mold you need to be aware of is you, you have the cutting flutes, then there's a shank, the shank goes into a collet, and then the collet goes into a Z stage. And any one of these can collide with your mold. So uh, you need to make sure that um, you're not asking uh, uh, the mill to plunge uh, so deep that you collide with these. Depending on the software you're using, it can simulate the complete tool but you need to check the, the exact shape of your tool versus the shape of your mold to prevent collisions. And one of the things that also helps with that, again, is draft angle, that um, if, if this is your tool, as long as you have ed, uh, edges um, that that can fit in, you can machine arbitrarily deep if, if the draft angle accounts for the um, shape of your tool. Uh, so for the software for this week, um, shop, there are a number of options. Uh, on ShopBot type tools, uh, VCarve Pro um, is a good solution for it. Uh, Fusion, uh, one of the strengths of Fusion is it has uh, CAM, uh, I'd say best integrated in it. And so uh, with Fusion, you can create the tool pass. And if you want to, um, go from soft molding to injection molding. Uh, mold flow actually lets you model how the material moves through the mold. So when you design an injection mold, for example, you want to figure out the rate it cools and where the interfaces are in the mold. Um, SolidWorks has uh, plastics. Um, FreeCAD has um, its toolpath. And then in mods, um, uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, I'm going to read in an STL. And then I'm first going to rough cut. And the depth down is it, using the tool diameter is a good rule of thumb for the depth cut. So here I'm making the um, uh, rough cuts. And so there's the tool path uh, ready to go to the machine. Um, so that's a rough cutting tool path. And then now for the finished cutting, um, I want to move Z at the same time as I move X or Y to get continuous uh, surfaces. So uh, here's my STL. And then uh, here's my continuous motion to get the smooth surface. And again, for machining, you're going to just be limited by your time on the machine for how fine a step over you, you can take the time. And so that, there's my toolpath uh, ready to machine. Uh, so that's rougher finished cutting. And so now we're going to do an experiment this week. So let's go back to molding and casting. Uh, up until today, we always had you machine molds, and it was for two reasons. We wanted you to learn molding and casting, and we wanted you to learn uh, three-axis machining. Um, let's see, Bob Kess is asking about EDM. Um, yeah, EDM isn't a good match for this. So for e there's sinker EDMs where you make a tool, there's wire EDMs, um, but generally, you don't use EDMs for complex 3D shapes. Uh, you use EDMs to cut out profiles um, with high aspect ratios and clean edges. I, yeah, I don't think EDM is promising for this. So in the past, you would all machine because we all wanted you to learn how to do three-axis machining, and we wanted molding and casting. The reason we're revisiting that is this picture. Th this was Adrian carefully machining a mold. 
Um, this is Pablo 3D printing it on a resin printer. And the resin printers have gotten, it used to be these were $100,000 printers. Now they're a few hundred dollar printers can print at that resolution. So we want you to design a mold. And I guarantee this will be confusing. Um, you're going from positive to negative to positive, And a surprising number of people go through all the steps and then realize their mold was the Boolean inverse of what they wanted to make. Um, so um, you'll start by making a rigid mold. Um, in it, you'll cast an elastomer. The reason we're doing that again is if you want to cast something rigid in something rigid, you need to carefully deal with the draft angles and the mold release, and you can't have overhangs. Uh, if you cast an elastomer in something rigid, you just pop it out. Now, if you want a finished part that's flexible, you can start stop with the elastomer. But if you want a finished part that's rigid, um, uh, you're going to make the rigid mold, make the elastomer, and then in that, you'll, you'll cast the rigid part. So you're going from positive to negative uh, to positive. Um, and then... Let's see, I'm making a note to mention. We want it to have a smooth surface finish. Um, I'm not giving you an exact number, but if you machine it, the mold, um, it should look like that. Um, if you print, actually, th th this is even uh, better. It doesn't have to be quite that perfect, but it has to be in that neighborhood. Uh, if you print the mold, it has to look uh, this good. So it's not enough to use an ordinary FDM printer to make the mold, because you'll see the uh, FDM roads. Um, if you want to try to FDM print a mold, you need to post-process it to make an acceptable surface finish. <clears throat> and so in um, 3D printing week, I had talked about, um, for example, uh, SmoothOn has this material to fill in the roads in an FDM print to give you a better surface finish. But what we want to see this week is a mold that's roughly as good as you, that, that it should feel smooth. And you or your lab can pick either printing or machining. There's arguments for both, and so either is fine. But the one thing we want to do is we do want your lab to show both. So in your lab, we want to see both printed and machine molds. Individu individually, you can pick which of them you do. Now, if you print your mold for this week, in wildcard week, I'm going to cover all sorts of options. But if you don't do full three-axis machining this week, I would encourage you to do it in wildcard week so you learn how to do it. It's an important skill if you don't do that this week. But, or end, you're going to design a mold around the process, uh, produce it with a good surface finish, cast parts. Um, one kind of extra credit is uh, you can go from one to two to more than two mold parts. You can make complex geometries by nesting mold parts. Um, another thing I'll add a note you could do for extra credit is insert molding. Um, so we, we had the, um, uh, from Aguilab, the controller where you hold it and it feels good. And that's a good example where you want to actually insert mold, the mold right around the electronics uh, inside of it. Um, or if you want to make a display, you can put L LEDs in a translucent material. Now, in your labs, we'll start with, again, umu, hydrostone, dry stone, these basic materials. Um, beyond that, you're welcome to experiment with both other commercial materials and DIY materials. Um, something else you can do, um, your lab should be set up with the um, Cerro True. Now, remember that the hydrostone and dry stone were a dollar a pound. Um, the, this is 
$22 a pound. So it's uh, much more expensive for the metal casting. So you can't use that in, in at all the same volume. But one of the really fun things you can do with that is make uh, jewelry or coins. And so in your lab, I'd like you to see all of these different materials. Each of you can pick individually for what you do with the project. Um, likewise, if you're going to do food safe, um, uh, let's see, uh, Leo's asking about reusing it. Um, I'd say, um, yeah, when you reuse it, um, yeah, it doesn't come back yeah, as perfect as uh, the new wax. I don't have a great suggestion for that other than um, this, which is, there's a very, I didn't, yeah, I should have shown this. There's a very active hobbyist community uh, making their own uh, machinable wax. And so um, I, I, if you're interested, I would go down the path of learning how to make your own machinable wax. Um, we have actually used the same wax for the last nine years. And one of the tricks we are doing is that when we melt it, we let it cool very slowly. Oh, that's interesting. But that does make sense that it would lock up stress unless it's adiabatic. Interesting. Um, and then once again, if you want to experiment with food, this is, so when I say it's like being kosher, kosher food has to be kosher every step of the process. Uh, food safe has to be safe every step of the process. For food safe, you need to make sure all the materials um, uh, maintain the food safety. I wouldn't do this, for example, with printed molds because I don't. I wouldn't trust those materials. Um, you need to be really careful about the food safety throughout. But once you do that, um, uh, it's it's great fun to make your own uh, food safe materials. So this is one of the most expressive weeks. Uh, both for the mold design and the mold material. And this is an experiment to compare. I, I do want to make sure everybody sees both printing and machining, but it's an experiment to compare who, who machines and who prints, and, and we'll see what the results for that are next week. So with that, open time as usual, Adrian and team. It looks like people are making good use of it. Uh, no recitation this week and then don't be too greedy in your mold don't make it too large don't have uh, too much of a dynamic range between the biggest and small features you're going to be limited by if you're printing printing fi at fine resolution if you're machining machining with fine step over so don't be too heroic in your mold design and get the design done quickly you're going to be rate limited by just not by the molding and casting time, but the time on the mold making for either process this week. So get on those as early as you can. And that's molding and casting. This ends up being one of the most expressive fun weeks. I'm eager to see what you all make in a week. Bye bye. Hey, hey. Bye bye. See ya. Ciao, ciao. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.